Okay, we are now going to start talking about the next group in our lineup, the amniotes. So as usual, <clears throat> we're going to cover the included taxa in the, the group, the amniota. We'll talk about the major features that all of the amniotes have, and then we'll begin to talk about um, the unique features that each of the clades or major groups within the amniotes possess. Now that said, um, your book is a little unusual in this regard in that it covers the amniotes, and in the same chapter, in chapter 18, it then begins to cover um, what are traditionally referred to as the reptiles. But what we'll talk about today is a, the fact that the reptiles are not a monophyletic group, and B, really we're not going in phylogenetic order as we have been doing the entire semester. Um, but for this year, we're going to continue on with the group, um, with, the, with the order of the chapters, and I'll explain the details as we go along. So what we're going to talk about today are the amniotes, the turtles in the order Testudines, we're going to talk about the superorder Lepidosauria, which includes the lizards, the snakes, and the tuataras, and we'll talk about the subgroups within. So the order Sphenodontida includes the tuataras, that's these guys here. We'll talk about the order Squamata, which includes lizards and snakes together. We'll then talk about the suborder Sauria, the lizards, the suborder Serpentes, which are the snakes, and then we'll finish up with the order Crocodilia, which is the crocodiles, alligators, and gharials. Although we'll spend a little bit of time talking about why this is kind of odd. So we really don't recognize order Crocodilia separate from the birds. Instead, we'll talk about the Archosauria, but I'll explain that when we get there. First, let's talk about amniotes. So this is the tree from your book, uh, which I think represents things kind of strangely, but um, here's the amniota right here. So we've covered all the rest of the, these other groups. Here's the amniota. So let's zoom in on this. And here's the image from your book. So these are all the remainder of the taxa that we're gonna cover this year. So the, the mammals, um, these together are the Lepidosauria and subdivided into the tuataras, which are in the group Sphenodontida. These are the squamates, so lizards, all kinds of groups of lizards, and the snakes. Here's the turtles, and here's the crocodilians and birds, okay? So as I mentioned, it's kind of odd. So chapter 18 covers all of these taxa here in the middle. Then we cover the birds in chapter 19, and the mammals in chapter 20. Why they do that order is beyond me. Next year, I'm gonna reverse all that, but we'll go with it for this year. Okay, so these are all the included groups, and there's one other thing I'd like to note about this tree. So they represent this tree as having um, an unresolved node here between lizard snakes and tuataras, turtles, and then birds and crocs. But many people traditionally place the turtles here um, right after the split between the mammals and everything else. So normally turtles are here, then you have lizard snakes and tuataras, crocodilians, and then birds. Uh, but there seems to be some debate going on as a result of new information that's been applied to the turtles. So for now, we'll leave it as this unresolved node. Okay, so the key features of the amniotes. So, um... The amniotes um, had um, uh, several major evolutionary innovations, but the biggest one that probably had the most uh, important impact was the development of the amniote egg. And I'm showing you an image here of um, how that's a, a, a representation of that. And so there, there are several things that make this um, evolution of this type of egg really important. And the major feature is that by virtue of the types of membranes that it possesses, uh, the function of each of those membranes and the fact that this was originally a shelled egg meant that amniotes were able to then leave the water whereas prior prior to that with the amphibians they were tied to the water to some greater or lesser extent but they were pretty tied to the water at least for reproduction if for nothing else many of them had their whole lives tied to water but with this shelled egg they were now able to lay their eggs on land and actually leave their eggs um, and they would develop on their own without them being present. So this is a major 
um, separation and, and evolutionary innovation that allowed um, for greater invasion onto terrestrial um, surfaces. So let me explain this egg to you. What I'm showing you is sort of a stylized egg here that has what looks like kind of a, a lizard or maybe even a crocodilian inside, but it doesn't matter what the taxon is on the inside. What I want you to notice is um, there are several um, um, parts to the amniotic egg that you need to be familiar with. The first is the amnion. So the amnion you can see here in kind of a purplish hue. It's basically a water sac that surrounds the embryo directly and it protects it. So it protects it from movement or um, bombardment from the outside. The allantois, which is here kind of in red right here, this is the waste sac. So if you're completely enclosed within an egg, um, you still have metabolic processes going on all the time. Um, regardless of where you're getting your nutrition from. And so you have to release the waste products um, from that. And so if you were to just release them into your environment, particularly into this, um, or into this water sack, well, then you'd foul your environment and you would, it would be fatal to you. So this is a special um, sack that actually holds the waste uh, until after birth. The yolk sack, this one here in yellow, provides all the nutrients. So for those things that um, actually laid a shelled egg, these were all the nutrients that you needed to, um, uh, to absorb in order to um, come to the developmental stage after which you might be born. Now later we'll talk about things like mammals and different forms of mammals, particularly the placental mammals, where instead of having a yolk sac, they instead have um, an attachment to the mother and they get nutrients directly from the mother. And then the last is the chorion. So this is sort of here, this membrane here, that's sort of bluish purplish. So this is a membrane that surrounds everything else and is just on the inside of this shelled egg. So this allows, it's highly vascularized. It allows for gas exchange. So you need to have some way to get oxygen into um, the embryo and allow other gases to be dispersed. Um, so this chorionic membrane allows for that. It also allows um, for the prevention of dehydration. So for many shelled eggs, even though it looks like a hard shell, in fact, it's somewhat porous. And so it will allow for some um, uh, uh, water to enter into the egg, but not in high amounts. And it protects it from um, being overly hydrated. Although you could drown an egg for sure. Um, so it's, it's providing protection um, gas exchange, um, and uh, prevention of dehydration. So it's helping to keep the water inside that's already inside. So this is sometimes referred to as, the, as a cleidoic egg uh, or an amniotic egg. So whenever you see those terms, you know that they are um, similar. So going back to this phylogeny, um, just to be clear, so that amniotic egg, that evolved um, you know, here. So all of the amniotes had this. So later we're going to talk um, about the mammals, but just so that we're clear, because most people think of mammals as, you know, having live birth. But in fact, you are familiar with other groups that are unusual in that regard. Case in point, the, um, the platypus, although there are others. So this is a group of mammals referred to as the monotremes, and they um, do lay eggs. And these eggs were those cleidoic or amniotic eggs. And it was only later that they developed the placental condition that, that we have as well. So I'm going to talk more about that when we get to the mammals, but I just wanted to make it clear um, that at this initial branch down here at the base of the tree, we've just talked about the amniotic egg, but the first branch that you see coming off is mammals and then everything else. But in fact, early ancestral mammals did have a cleidoic egg. So let's move on and talk about more of the general characteristics of amniotes. So amniotes display um, what's referred to as three patterns of scale fenestrae. So fenestrae are um, whole, basically holes in the skull. And let me be clear about these holes. There's all kinds of holes in the skulls, but we're talking about a particular set of fenestrae that are um, in the skulls. And generally speaking, they are behind the orbit. Now the orbit is normally where your eyeball goes. So I'm gonna put a little eyeball in there. And in these three patterns of fenestrae, the first pattern is a lack of hole. So you only have a hole for the orbit. So this is referred to as the anapsid skull. So an meaning without, you know, the without the hole. So an anapsid, so no hole. So there is not an additional hole here in this anapsid. 
In the diapsid condition, now here's the orbit, so there's where your eyeball goes. In the diapsid condition, there are two, so diapsid, so di is two, apsid hole. So there's two fenestrae in the skull behind the orbit, <coughs> or posterior to the orbit. In the third condition, so here's the orbit, in the third condition, referred to as the synapsid, there's a single hole that is posterior to the orbit. And it's thought that this is probably a result of the fusion of these two holes together. And so that's why it's called synapsid. So three patterns of skull fenestrae. No hole, two holes, one hole, all of which are posterior to the orbit. So what are these holes for anyway? Why are they important? <coughs> Well, it's believed that there was a monophyletic group that gave rise to three patterns of fenestrae, again, located in the temporal region of the skull, and that these are allowing for muscle attachments that are associated with different feeding, and I say suctioning power here, but really it's associated with feeding. So once you get to the amniote condition, you've moved away from that sort of fish-like, amphibian-like suctioning power of getting food. What you see in the amniotes is that there's much more um, handling of the food, both just with their mouths, as well as with their hands and feet. <coughs> Excuse me. And so as a result, and depending on what it is that they're eating, they need significant um, muscular interaction with their jaws in order to be able to manipulate that food into their mouths. And depending on what kinds of food they're eating and how they're capturing them, these holes have allowed for additional muscle attachments that have allowed for the um, skull to move in ways that um, you weren't able to um, outside of the amniotes. So to sort of um, show you this, here are some images, cartoon images of a skull, and these lines are showing you the sort of biomechanical properties of um, the skull when it opens and closes. And this is supposed to be a stereotypical sort of lizard-like skull, but it could be anything. And so muscle attachments would then um, be connected to the quadrate, the pterygoid, and then associate, you know, attached to the outer, outer portions of these holes. And so what this is allowing is when the upper jaw goes, or when the jaws separate, and so um, lower jaw goes down, the upper jaw can actually go up, and you see quite a bit of skull kinesis in the amniotes, meaning that they can actually move parts of their um, skull, even, even the upper part of the jaw, with much greater flexibility um, than in some animals. And so these openings in the, in the temporal region allow for muscle attachments, um, which give greater kinetic uh, movement in the skull, which is good for feeding. Okay, so there's the amniote egg, there's the three patterns of skull fenestrae, and you also now see rib ventilation of the lungs. And so I neglected to show you this, but for comparison, here's a frog, here's an amphibian. And so we talked about um, respiration in the various amphibians, some of whom don't have lungs, let's say. We talked about respiration through the skin. But when you have lungs, you need to have a way of getting air into and out of those lungs. In the amphibians, they actually accomplish this by um, what's called rib, um, or sorry, uh, they either do it by gular pumping or rib ventilation. So let me show you a uh, video of this, if I can get this to work properly as opposed to just putting the link down below, which is what I normally do. Okay, so here's an, uh, a YouTube of a, a frog, and you'll see this happening with most frogs. So they'll pump their um, jaws up and down, which is referred to as gular pumping. I have no, there we go, there's our frog. And if I play this, actually let's start you over there, froggy. Here we go. So you can see he's actually pumping his throat up and down. And you don't really see the sides of his body um, uh, where the ribs would be moving in and out. Although they will. They can move those as well. But generally speaking, they're pumping um, air in and out of their um, lungs with gular pumping. Now that said, as it happens, at, when you examine all of the vertebrates, there's a number of different ways, uh, sorry, amniotes, there's a number of different ways that they can actually ventilate their lungs. They can do it with gular pumping, they can do it um, with uh, muscular uh, attachments um, to their ribs, uh, which I'm going to show you next. 
Or in the case of mammals, they have a fully developed diaphragm, which then allows their lungs to inflate and to deflate. So let me show you an example. This is a picture of a tokay gecko. Let's see if we can get this to work a little more quickly. So here's a lizard. And if you look at this lizard, you can actually see the sides of its body um, pumping in and out. So there are some lizards that actually have um, sort of a proto-diaphragm, but many of them are actually using a rib ventilation or a muscular attachments in their abdomen to pump that air in and out of their lungs. <clears throat> Hang on a second. There we go. Now, as you go, again, as you go through the amniotes, there are a number of different ways to accomplish this, but the point is that you, you're using the lug, lungs primarily for respiration. There are a variety of mechanisms for getting air into and out of the lungs, much of which has to do with um, uh, using the ribs, either through a diaphragm or muscular structures, muscular attachments. Amniotes also exhibit um, thicker, more waterproof skin. So as comparison to the amphibians, and this is a highly unusual amphibian, this is one of the many species of glass frogs, which have very thin skins, so much so that you can actually see into their bodies and see their organs. And by the way, note that they also have um, green bones, so they have a really high um, level of copper in their bones. So they have thin, um, um, thin skins that, as you know, re require them to be near water for many of the species, but not for all. Whereas with amnio, of these uh, structures that were on the skin, so either into hair or to feathers, and we'll talk about that when we get to mammals and when we get to birds. But suffice it to say that they have a, a much, all amniotes have a much thicker, more waterproof skin than the amphibians have. While I'm on the slide, I'd also like to point out these structures right here. These are melanophores. So as we go along, we may mention more uh, about those structures. So these are um, structures in the skin that allow you to change the color of the skin, which you see often in a number of um, lizards, uh, <clears throat> well, primarily lizards, um, and in some other animals. Um, and we'll talk about the diff the, what those melanophores do and how they do what they do in terms of changing the color of the skin. Okay, so something I'd like to point out um, in this phylogeny, going back to the book, um, is that there's a number of groups that are not considered to be monophyletic any longer. We know they're not based on a number of pieces of information, um, including molecular data as well as morphological data. So historically, these animals here in the middle are, have been referred to as reptiles. But as you can see, they do not form a single monophyletic group. And so that's a term we won't ever use um, um, in, in, in normal parlance in biology. So that's a, a sort of garbage can group. What you should note um, are the groups that actually are monophyletic. So the turtles themselves are, and we'll talk about the test two denies. Um, all of these guys together form a monophyletic group, the Lepidosauria, and we recognize three subgroups within, the Tuataras, which are in the Sphenodontata. The remainder of these guys are the Squamata. Lizards, um, and so snakes are uh, a group that have evolved from within um, the lizards. Um, now, as it happens, your book recognizes um, the... Uh, the lizards as being a monophyletic group separate from the snakes, but as it happens, it's not true. So snakes have evolved from within the lizards. And then also of note is um, the close relationship between crocodilians and birds. So we recognize the group Archosauria, and today we will talk about the crocodilians. Um, we'll save the birds for a separate lecture, but in future we, I won't. I'll include these together as a single lecture, the Archosauria. I also want to point out, um, I previously talked about those orbital fenestrae, so these holes on the um, posterior portion of the skull behind the orbit. So notice what's happening here. So it's believed that the anapsid condition, so anapsid, no hole, 
That's thought to be the ancestral condition prior to the amniotes. And then what we have is the synapsid skull. So mammals have a synapsid skull. The remainder of the amniota is considered to be diapsid, with one exception. Turtles have independently evolved the anapsid condition. Well, depending on who you talk to. Some people believe that they've independently evolved it. Others believe that they have retained it, while all the rest of these have evolved the, uh, from the diapsid condition. So that's one reason why the turtles are normally considered to be down here. Okay, so mammals are synapsids. Turtles are anapsids. Everyone else is a diapsid. Okay, so let's continue with the features of the amniotes. So other things that you notice is that the, the jaws are designed for gripping and crushing prey. So in comparison to the way that the frogs eat, and I'll show you a video in a moment, where they're still doing something related to, it's not really suctioning, but it's a combination of suctioning and using of the tongue, but they don't really manipulate the prey very much. Whereas with amniotes, they do manipulate the prey um, in much, uh, greater detail. So let me show you what I, what I mean by that. Oh, I'll show you this respiration video in a moment. So here's an example of a frog um, that's eating a uh, what's called a, a, a wax worm. And notice what it's doing here. It's, wait, it has, um, it's waiting for the food item to approach it. And then it basically sticks out its tongue and sucks it into its mouth very rapidly. And there's not much in the way of chewing. It basically makes a few motions with its mouth, but effectively just kind of sucks it down um, into its uh, stomach. Now, in contrast, let me show you a chameleon where you can see that it's going to manipulate the food quite a bit. It's going to chew it a bit before it swallows it. So here's a chameleon looking. It's going to get a cricket. Here we goes, boom. Oh, sorry, it's a wax worm. So notice how it's chewing, it's moving its mouth around, it's trying to manipulate it so that it goes down into its throat, it's using its tongue, it's using its muscles in the tongue, and it's using the muscles of the mouth. So what you see in the amniotes is much more prey handling going on. Just a moment as this reloads. Okay. So you find also that there's going to be a huge development in teeth. So you didn't really, you don't see teeth in the um, uh, amphibians, but in amniotes, you're going to see um, in extensive tooth development. And generally speaking, the morphology of the tooth tells you a lot about what they're eating. So if they have, say, sharp pointed teeth like this, and they're all um, um, homodont, you might say, so they're all the same. That usually indicates that they're just using them to grab prey and to mostly just either tear off bits of it or um, eat the thing whole. If you have something more like molars that allows you to crush prey up or, or crush food items up so that um, it's uh, more physically broken down before you swallow it. Um, we'll talk about more of the different types of teeth when we get um, further on beyond just talking about the general characteristics of amniotes. Okay, amniotes have a much more efficient and versatile circulatory systems, uh, specifically referring to the heart. So um, if you look at the fish heart, remember it was very simple, basically a, a very simplified heart structure here, and it was a sort of one-way um, movement of the heart. So it only had two compartments, really, or two compartments. So the um, circulation or the blood would go to the gills to get oxygen, pretty much go straight to the body after that, and then ultimately return to the heart. In amphibians and in many of the reptiles, they have a three-chambered heart, so they have two atria and a single ventricle. And this allows for um, blood to be pumped to the lungs or you know whatever is circulating um, yeah, to your lungs to pick up oxygen. It's then returned to the heart and then gets pumped out to the body. Now, on the one hand, this is more efficient, more muscular pumping, so it allows for greater circulation and more efficient circulation compared to the fish. 
But there is a problem with this, and that, and that is that unoxygenated blood that's coming to the heart is going to mix with oxygenated blood that's come from the lungs. So while this is uh, somewhat of an improvement over what the fish, condition, the fish condition is, it could be made more efficient, and you do see it increasing in its efficiency when you get to the birds and the mammals. In the birds and mammals, you have a four-chambered heart. The right side of the heart pumps blood, um, unoxygenated blood, out to the lungs, where it picks up oxygen, uh, now indicated in red. It returns to the left side of the heart, where it's then pumped out to the rest of the body. And so in this way, you can efficiently pick up oxygen and then carry it to the rest of the body without it mixing with unoxygenated blood. And to give you a greater appreciation for how the heart works, I know you've covered this in lab, but let me show you this video here. Just a moment. The human heart has four chambers. The two upper chambers are the atria, and the two lower chambers are the ventricles. The interatrial septum separates the two atria, and the interventricular septum is the partition between the two ventricles. The right atrium and right ventricle are connected through a tricuspid valve. As the name suggests, it has three leaflets or cusps. On the other side, the left atrium and ventricle are connected through a bicuspid valve. The bicuspid valve is also called the mitral valve because of its resemblance to a bishop's two-sided mitre or hat. The leaflets of these atrioventricular valves are connected to fibrous tissue called the chordae tendinae, which in turn are attached to papillary muscles. Contraction and relaxation of these muscles make the valves open and close. There are also valves at the opening of the pulmonary trunk and the iota. These are called the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, respectively. Because of their crescent moon shape, these two valves are also called semilunar valves. The characteristic double-up sound of the heartbeat is produced during the closing of the heart valves. The thickness of the walls of the four heart chambers varies with their functions. The walls of the atria are thinner than those of the ventricles, as the blood needs to be pumped into adjacent ventricles only. The left ventricle pumps blood a greater distance at higher pressure. Therefore, the wall of the left ventricle is thicker than that of the right ventricle. The sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, bundle of HIS and Purkinje fibers represent the specialized cardiac tissue. These fibers are auto-excitable as they have the potential to generate electrical activity without any external stimuli. This makes the heart beat continuously. How the heart works. By the way, I didn't show you the video of respiration, so let me briefly show you this. Is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin, dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. It gains its shape from its attachments and from the organs that surround it, especially the heart, lungs, and liver. The diaphragm attaches at the costals along the lower rib cage, high in the front at the sternum, and deeply in the back along the spine. The diaphragm also attaches to itself by a central tendon, making the diaphragm one of the unique muscles of the body. The diaphragm uses its central tendon and its attachments as leverage to flatten during inhalation. The expansion of the ribs comes from the resistance of the internal organs to downward movement. As the internal organs are slow to move, the ribs expand to make room for the lungs. While the diaphragm attaches at the bottom of the ribs, its range of motion never reaches that low in the body. As seen from below, we get a sense of the full range of motion of the diaphragm as it would glide over the aorta, the vena cava, the esophagus, in the internal organs. For more information, visit www.3dyoga.com. The ribs ventilate. 
Okay, so going back here. So you get much more efficient ventilation or uh, circula circulation uh, among the amniotes, um, thanks to development of the heart among other structures. You also have more efficient strategies for water conservation as well. Um, now, in comparison to the amphibians, so when the amphibians uh, excrete metabolic waste, um, so from, from the kidneys, it's referred to as being ammoniotelic. So generally when you pick up a frog, it'll pee on you. Uh, and when it does, most of that urine is, it's water. There's nitrogen in there too. But it's kind of more related to, say, ammonia. Whereas um, in non-avian reptiles, uh, so to speak, so basically in um, uh, lizards, snakes, uh, and tuataras, the wastes are referred to as urecotelic. So this happens to be solid waste, so we're not referring to that, but this part right here. So often they don't urinate um, in a liquid form, it's more of a solid form. So they've basically retained all of the water inside their body and they're only releasing the nit nitrogenous part of it. So it's referred to as urecotelic. So it doesn't have very much water in it. And then some amniotes, um, the rest of the amniotes fall somewhere in between. So they may have greater or lesser amounts of um, nitrogen in their urine when they excrete it out. They also, most amniotes have a more complex nervous system compared to what we've seen um, throughout the rest of uh, the taxa, um, but even compared to the amphibians. So as an example, here's an amphibian brain, which is actually quite well developed compared to what we saw with um, Amphioxus and even the Agnathans. So you can see the four mid and hind brains are much better developed than what we saw in those previous animals. But compare that to what we're going to see in many of the um, amniotes, and in particular the human. The brain has been vastly um, developed in, in comparison to those amphibians. And the four mid and hind brains have further developed um, structures associated with much more complex function, functions. So cognition, um, sensory organs associated with our bodies and our movements, the control of the body and all of the organs within much more complicated and thus we have bigger brains and more well-developed portions of our brains. I haven't yet also talked about the nervous system, so the central nervous system relating to the nerves connected throughout our body, but those are also much better developed in the amniotes. So we've seen nerve cords running throughout the animals, but they're much more elaborately developed um, within the amniotes. And you'll talk a lot more about that when you get to physiology. So I'm actually going to stop this lecture here for the moment, and I'm going to cover all of the taxa within the amniota in a subsequent lecture, which I'll post in just a moment.